All right, Free Agency Week is finally here, and joining me now, he does a little bit of everything at ESPN, from fantasy to breaking news to draft work to hosting to salary cap and much more, and he's a new dad, so congrats on that. Joining me now, it is Field Yates. Field, thanks for coming on. A busy week personally and work-wise for you, huh? Yeah, it's a fun time of the year, though. Uh, It's been really, really great to gear up for free agency, but I'm glad that we are finally here. No more dot connecting or guessing how much a guy is going to get paid or what might be the best fit. Now we just get to see where the chips fall and how things are reshaped in the NFL across the landscape. And uh, I would suspect we'll have a very, very busy weekend. It will be a very busy weekend. It'll be very exciting. A lot of roster shuffling. Everyone is zero and zero. All teams are, all fans are very excited for their futures of their team. And last week was a crazy week. You know, we already got started last week, right? And the last news that we kind of got ending the week was Deshaun Watson. So I want to start off with him because it really, it's escalated pretty quickly as soon as we got word that there won't be any criminal charges. Um, you know, there are still many layers to this, obviously. There's a civil part of it. There could be discipline from the league. But sure. sticking to football a little bit, the team that you think would make most sense for Watson as things are heating up, a lot of reports are out there, which team is that for you? Yeah, so I just want to make a quick note is that it's really impossible to discuss this situation without identifying the fact that there still are 22 yes. civil lawsuits. We don't know exactly how those are going to play out, whether there will be a settlement, whether there will not be a settlement. And to your point, could the NFL potentially punish Deshaun Watson in the form of a suspension? A lot of questions remain, and it's hard for me sometimes to just separate the football, right. but doing as best we can. If you were to just ask me, Deshaun Watson at the age of 26 years old, in the prime or close to prime of his career, if there's a team that makes the most sense, I think you have to sort of break it down into two different categories. I think that Tampa Bay might make the most sense, given that roster is excellent, pending a bunch of free agents they have coming up here uh, in the open market, that whether they stay or go, there are still a lot of pieces in place on offense on defense, coaching staff front office that are really strong. Now, if Tampa Bay were to make a play for Deshaun Watson, assuming no restructured contract, which I suppose is very possible, they got to find some money to accommodate a trade for Deshaun Watson. And obviously they'd have to trade away significant draft capital and potentially some young players as well. But a team that's very close to being right back or near the top of not just the NFC South, but potentially the league, Deshaun Watson makes sense in that regard. Now, if you were to ask me who makes the most sense that I think has more viability, it's a little bit of a different conversation. I keep coming back to two teams that I do think kind of stack up and make some sense. And they've been the most rumored team for Deshaun Watson to this point. It's the Carolina Panthers. It's the Seattle Seahawks. And the Carolina Panthers, I think we all know why it makes sense. They have been trying for over a year now to acquire a franchise quarterback. They are close enough salary cap wise, just a couple moves away from accommodating that $35 million uh, salary cap number for Deshaun Watson. This is year three for head coach Matt Rule. And I thought it was a step back or close to it last year for yeah. that franchise. Uh, even not like, you know, they, were, they had the eighth overall pick the year before. It's not like uh, going from eight to six is total destruction, but I think we all kind of hope they'd make that leap. Um, and the other one is Seattle. And the reason why I keep coming back to Seattle. It's for one sort of specific reason, and I could be reading too much into this, but as we all know, the Seahawks are going to trade Russell Wilson officially once the league year begins. But if this is a team that was prepared to tear this thing down, when Seattle in that trade for Russell Wilson, when they had the leverage, right, they had the piece that was most valuable. Would they say to Denver, hey, we want to take back a 31-year-old defensive tackle than Shelby Harris, who, make no mistake, is a really darn good player. But if you're a team trying to rebuild, you're looking for as much youth and draft capital as you can get. And they got that with Drew Locke to a degree and certainly no fans in those couple first round picks and seconds. But I thought that was notable that this might be more of a retool than a rebuild. And at last check and things things can change in a moment's notice. They were hovering north of $50 million in salary cap space prior to the Russell Wilson trade becoming official. But still, 50 million bucks makes them another team that I think makes uh, some sense for Deshaun Watson. Yeah. And I think it's probably worth noting as well. Pete Carroll, 70 years old, up there in age. Don't think he's looking to rebuild. Remodel is probably the right word, like you said there, for a team like them. Um, So they're definitely in it. I was kind of looking at three teams that really have not been mentioned much, but it's 
Philadelphia and Jalen Hurts. There's Cleveland of Baker Mayfield and there's Miami of Tua, three middle tier quarterbacks. If you're those teams, are you trying to be aggressive in this market or are you sticking with what you have right now? Yeah, I'm going to take Miami at their word that they've gone down that path. They nearly got there last year and then things change and they are no longer invested in the two, excuse me, in the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes. So I am going to, at least in my own mind, categorize them as a non-factor in this sweepstakes. Philadelphia, um, there's been enough reporting that like, even if Philly was interested, the question would be whether Deshaun is interested in going there. But as you know, as you know, very well, what makes Philly so compelling is that if Houston wants three first round picks for this deal, Philly can say, hey, we got three sitting here for this year. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, is the sixth overall pick that Carolina currently owes equal to at least two of those first round picks from Philly right now? Maybe even, you know, Philly's two first round picks plus more. And you can make the argument that it is. But um, Cleveland is is intriguing to me uh, as you know, we the Amari Cooper trade is another signal that they are, you know, this team wants to win now. It's not like yeah. it's any mystery. They had a disappointing season this past year. The problem that both Carolina and Cleveland are facing right now is that they've got $18.5 million of not quite dead weight, but it would be dead weight in the Sean Watson scenario because both Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold are on that same fifth year option. That if I'm Houston and they say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll send you back Baker Mayfield or Sam Darnold, I'd say, why? You know, if, if they want to send back Sam, uh, Sam Donald or Baker Mayfield right. and attach more draft capital to them, that's fine by me. I would entertain that conversation. But I personally don't view Baker or Sam Darnold as the kind of building block piece that Houston want to turn to at quarterback. So the Cleveland makes some sense to me. I don't exactly know how it would get done. Uh, a lot of draft capital and some young pieces. And they do have some young pieces on that roster that could be compelling. Uh, and Andrew Barry is a pretty smart guy. He's resourceful. And I think that uh, that could be worth not uh, monitoring over these next few days. Cause I don't know. I don't think this Deshaun Watson situation is going to percolate for too, too long only because there are so many things that are dependent upon Deshaun's future that <clears throat> teams are going to be mindful of and how they spend in free agency could be dictated at least in part by what Deshaun does. And it definitely sounds like Nick Casero is someone who's, you know, kind of ready to move on already. Teams are ready to line up the offers of what he's been looking for, which has been reported as three ones and a few more assets as well. And there are a bunch of teams ready and willing to do that. Of course, there are some stuff, like you mentioned in the beginning, that are still ongoing. The thing that most of the teams have been keeping an eye on was the criminal charges, which, of course, did not go down on Friday. And it's worth noting, again, these teams aren't just waking up now. They've been, you know, doing due diligence for months and months. And now they are ready to pull the trigger for this. I want to shift over to a different GM. And that's Ryan Poles, who I know you've talked a lot about how great he is. I got to talk to him a little bit at the Senior Bowl. Seems to be a great guy. He pulled off a trade for Cleo Mack. He's cutting Eddie Goldman, cut Tariq Cohen. It sounds like there are more moves possibly coming there. I believe he's doing it the right way. I mean, you got to build this roster back up. What's your take on how he's doing and the outlook for him as a GM in Chicago? Yeah, I think one of the uh, the only bad part of when people know that you have a relationship with a general manager is that when you say something favorably about that person after it's out there, is that people think it's like you're carrying that individual's water. And I want to listen. I, I've I've told Ryan this: like my job is not to be his hype man; it's to be objective and fair. In the same way that if the roles were reversed, he would have to do the same thing. But I actually do think this is the right way to go if you're Chicago and. In the NBA, we have this world of extremes. We're either at the top or you're, you're sort of fighting to the bottom, right? In the NFL, we have, I would say, more teams that kind of chase the middle. We see it every year. There are a handful of teams, maybe 10, 12, that are like, you know, I don't like. I'll give you an example of a team last year. Maybe they had, they had higher hopes. Uh, but like Minnesota was a team that like, they weren't terrible, right? They lost every game it felt like was a one-score game. But like if, if they kept losing those games, it also meant they weren't dominant, right? They were just like a team somewhere in that middle third of the league. Uh, now you fast forward, and here we are, and you're for the Bears. Listen, Khalil Mack has you know, the potential to be a pro football Hall of Famer one day. But at 31 years old, and for 60-some million dollars over the next three years in both cap and cash, what's the value if you're a GM – and keeping somebody around like that going forward. I mean, I'm not saying he is, he is, um, there is no value to him. I mean, he's a good player. He's a respected worker. All of those things are important. 
But if you're Ryan Poles, you kind of kind of take the long view. And your colleague uh, Brad Spielberger drew this this analog that I think I think was was notable and I think was smart is that when Brandon Bean became the general manager of the Bills, he basically said, "I'm going to take the hits now. Do it now. Do it early." Right? I mean, you're trading away guys, you're taking on dead money and bad contracts, and getting rid of the actually getting rid of the bad contracts. Like clean the books up now because no GM's plan in his ideal mind is, "Hey, I'm going to like." hand out some bad contracts here, undo them there. And then I'm going to sign a couple of guys in free agency at top dollar. And I'm going to find somebody off the scrap heap for nothing. Like we're still Douglas last year. No, like GMs envision usually drafting well, being uh, accountable, but not um, irresponsible in free agency in a perfect world, retaining your own. So I think if you're Ryan Poles, your, your goal right now is to help Justin Fields get better. And that is how they are different than Buffalo. Buffalo had to subsequently find their quarterback. Chicago's is there. But I do think that playing the long game right now and acquiring some draft capital and acquiring, I I don't know if they're going to be players, but moving on from players that are going to be, the the contracts are like balloons. um, You have to, at some point, move forward and transition forward. So I'd rather take my lumps almost all right away as opposed to sort of sporadically and kind of keep kicking the can a little bit and be okay, but not good or not great. Right. And the analogy you gave of what Brad mentioned is is kind of perfect. I mean, again, if you guys recall what Buffalo did when he came in, there was a Sammy Watkins trade. There was Marcel Darius. There was a bunch of key players who were drafted in high rounds by the previous regime, but it was like, we're not anywhere right now. We're in the middle. We're not even in the middle. Let's hit the reset button and then eventually get back up. And Buffalo did it fairly quickly. Chicago has the potential to do that as well. They're projected to have a lot of cap space next year once all these contracts come off the books. And it looks like that is the plan for Ryan Poles here this offseason. A guy does not have a first round pick as well because of that Justin Fields trade from the previous regime. Of course, they hope he is the answer at quarterback there in Chicago. Um, Let me shift over to free agency because it's going to be a crazy week. Like we mentioned in the beginning, there are a bunch of, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's as top heavy as usual, but there's a bunch of players out there that are available. I think one of the guys near the top is probably JC Jackson. And the question for you, I guess, is top corner available, but why would New England not use the tag on him one? And then if he does leave, where do you believe is the best landing spot for a guy like him who's likely going to have a massive market? Yeah, I, by the way, I agree with the notion that like this is not necessarily a top heavy free agent market. I wouldn't be surprised if like the primary stories of this week, I think we all know what they likely are. If Deshaun Watson gets traded, that's one of them. He's taking if Jimmy over. Garoppolo gets traded, that's one of them. If Aaron Rodgers' deal gets done and there's resolution there, I know he's coming back, but he yeah. hasn't yet signed his contract, and we'll see uh, when that gets done. That's one of them. And then if a team has a Patriots like splurge from last year, that's one of them. But I don't think that like you know we're going to wake up on Tuesday morning and a lead story on Sports Center is going to be hey you know um, like Chandler Jones signs with the Vikings three years sixty million bucks. He's a really good player, obviously, but I, I don't you know like. I'm just saying, I don't think that's the kind of story we have out of this free agency. So to spin it back to J.C. Jackson here, a homegrown player, undrafted free agent, out of Maryland, started at Florida, um, has been spectacular on the ball. He has the most interceptions entering the league, 25, one of the best four-year stints to begin any player's career. I mean, it's like in the same breath as like Richard Sherman and a couple other really, really talented uh, players, pro football Hall of Famer uh, in the future, like Richard Sherman. Um, so no doubt he has a unique skill set. And I, I, I don't know the specific answer as to why the Patriots did not decide to franchise tag J.C. Jackson. Uh, sometimes what happens is when a team has a player extension eligible and they're unable to get something done during the season, this is just me sort of hypothesizing here, is that if it looks like you're not going to get a deal done, like your value in, in your the value in, in, your, in your franchise's eyes versus the player's eyes is so disparate, then you have to ask yourself a question like if we're going to pay him, I think the franchise tag for a corner would have been like seven, called $17 million just to make it round this year. $17 million for one more year. That's also a $17 million cap hit, which means that we're going to have to either move a bunch of money around or cut guys uh, to keep you around. And if that just, if this is just paving the way for you to be gone a year from now, then it may not be the best use of your resources and your cash and your cap. That being said, 
a lot of teams could use a 26 year old ball hawk and there's been a number of teams linked to that uh, linked to jc jackson whether it's the dolphins whether it's the Bengals, whether it's the chargers i think anybody who has a quarterback need is going to turn there first and wouldn't stun me if the number is something like five years and 90 or 95 or hundred million dollars. I mean, it really wouldn't, I don't know if it's going to you know, surpass Jalen Ramsey, but he's not going to be too far off. Uh, there's a reason why, you know, guys who are elite co- cover corners get paid a lot and he certainly classifies. So I think he'll be, if you'd ask me like the, the, the five players most likely to earn the biggest contract in terms of total value, I think there's a chance that uh, J.C. Jackson's in that top five. He and Teron Armstead are two of the guys that keep coming to mind for me. Yep, I mean, they're definitely up there when it comes to free agents. I was going to ask you, you know, if New England, though, they're, I don't know if it's really a tactic, but not tagging him. Do you believe they're looking at this as, J.C., go look at the market and come back to us before you agree to a deal? I think there's unquestionably that's part of the messaging for, for any team, really, is that, like, we are – you know, we're not gifting you something, but we have prevented you or we could have prevented you from hitting the open market, which is what any player in the prime of his career wants to do. Right. And my guess would be that if JC Jackson goes and he gets three offers and he said, and I'm just, again, making them up four for 81 and five for 96 and, yeah. you know, three for 62 or something, he might go to New England and say, listen, before I say goodbye, right. I mean, I played a lot of football here, played really well there. Patriots, if they don't keep J.C. Jackson, they're going to need to find another cornerback, um, whether it's in free agency at a lesser number or whether it's in the draft. I, I would think there's going to be some dialogue there. But, um, you know, I think if I had to assess the likelihood that he returns, it's probably low, not high. Right. I believe they did that with Trent Brown a couple of years ago, got the massive offer from the Raiders. They weren't going to match it. He He's moved on. And then came back eventually. But um, that's the way New England does it. All right. Let me shift over to somebody who's in that middle tier of free agents. And that is Mitchell Trubisky, who has been getting yeah, yeah. a lot of that. hype out here. And, you know, I haven't been ready to bite on it just yet, but it's out there. And everyone is talking about him. Do you believe he's going to be somebody who comes a free agent, gets a starting job right away? Or are we jumping too far right now? No, I think he's going to get paid. And when I say paid, I don't mean to make $25 million a year. Like, let's say Jimmy Garoppolo gets traded. I think he'll extend for something like 33 or 35 or $37 million per year, right? He's right. Um, that, That's how it works at that part of the market. I think Trubisky is going to end up uh, getting pretty good cash, though. Like, a few years ago, this is more than a few years ago now, but, you know, Mike Lennon got three years, $42 million. Might have been really two for 28 from the bears. I think the initial reporting was three for 42. I mean, we've seen yeah. you know, Nick Bowles a couple of years ago, got four years, $88 million. I'd be surprised if a team went long-term on Mitch Trubisky. And I think in some ways, uh, Mitch could be well-served to go shorter term as well, like one to two years, because if you play really well at 15 to $20 million a year, you can turn that into like, if you play, if you sign a one year, $50 million deal, and you play well, then he's looking at four years and 140 million next year or something like that if you play extremely well because he's still young. Um, so I'm having a hard time with this one because and I want every player to get paid as much as he can, and I don't want any player to fail. Uh, but this is a guy who's available last year, right? And um, I can draw a parallel to Teddy Bridgewater, which I will do in a sec. But you know, Trubisky last year was available, and there there was a different quarterback market, obviously, right? We did not have a bunch of veterans available in free agency, but Teddy Bridgewater got traded. Ham Newton was available. Obviously there were five uh, first round pick quarterbacks, but still like, if you think there's a chance that he is worthwhile, why wasn't he on someone's radar more last year? And there's truly nothing he did on the football field this year to persuade you. He's a, he's a better player than he was last year, right? He went to Buffalo and he played for obviously an exceptional team and, served as the backup, but he didn't play, right? I mean, Josh Allen was the quarterback. So Teddy Bridgewater a few years ago left after Minnesota. He ends up in New Orleans uh, by virtue of the the Jets, Jets, right? It was the Jets originally, but it's like he and Jameis Winston both have gone to New Orleans as backups. Remember, Teddy Bridgewater did have that short stint filling in for Drew Brees. I think it was five Five games. Drew Brees hurt his thumb two years ago, and he went five and oh. He parlayed that into a twenty-one million dollar per year contract, sixty-three million dollars from Carolina. Yeah, and I, I, looking back on it, like you can see why maybe there was a reason why he was not coveted, like 
starter the year prior, right? He is to me like somewhere between the 25th and 35th best quarterback in the NFL. He's the kind of guy you want starting just a few games per year or as a really solid number two quarterback that if something happens to your starter can fill in. So um, I think Mitch is going to get paid. <clears throat> Excuse me. I still think there is some buyer beware there. Um, but I'm, and, and, you know, in talking to people around the league, when you run this scenario by them, the people that are on teams that don't need a quarterback are sometimes like, I, I see it similar, similarly to you. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the appeal is. Right. The people that need a quarterback will say, hey, you know, sort of remind you some of the traits, right? Like athletic, you know, he had some qualities, you know, games earlier in his, in his NFL career. I'm, I, again, I'm, I, to be clear, I'm, I'm more on the side of the buyer beware, yeah. but when pickings are slim, teams are going to talk themselves into something. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the only appeal is probably 28 years old, 27 years old. There aren't enough quarterbacks to fill all the seats. So one team is going to get desperate mm-hmm. to do it, probably. That's where it comes in. Yeah. And we've heard all the teams already out there. It's all rumors. Again, I haven't I haven't really hit on it yet. I haven't put it out there yet. I'm not ready to. I want to see it to believe it. But um, okay. you never know of this free agent market. It could eventually happen. One year, 15 million, go there you know, compete for the starting job and boom, you know, this is the guy that picked the number two overall. That's what we were expecting. But um, I'm more of a, yeah, it's really crazy because, you know, you think about it, like think about the mo- the monumental pressure that could be on Trubisky, because I don't believe he's going to go somewhere where the team is not expecting to be good this year. Right. Mm-hmm. Like he, he's going somewhere where the expectation is to win, whether it's, I'm just making this up, Indianapolis as an example, or New Orleans as an example. Like, they're not signing him to just look, yeah, Pittsburgh, right? Like, and that to me would be an interesting feeling to have to absorb for this entire offseason as a front office if he is indeed your go-to guy going into the year. It's um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. (laughs) It's, it's, um, I, I just haven't really been able to figure out what side I'm on. It's like, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Let me shift over to some guy who used to catch passes from Mitchell Trubisky, and that is Allen Robinson. And he appears to be up there as a top wide receiver here in this market yeah. after all the tags were put out there. He's always been, you know, everyone said he's never had a top quarterback. Well, this is his chance to go out and find one here in for agency. Um, I want to ask you like this, I guess, with all the receivers in this draft, with the down year, I guess, that he's coming off of, where do you believe his market is at? And I guess where would be his best fit here in for agency? So I think sometimes what we do is we just like compare a guy to a previous player and say, hey, Kenny Galladay got four years and $72 million. Well, <laughs> should, the, should the Giants have done that? Like there was questions whether they should have done it at the time of the deal. And retroactively, you know, he had zero touchdowns this past year. It looks like, you know, a lot of money to, uh, that's been not misallocated, but probably was a bit of an overspend. That being said, <clears throat> Allen Robinson is a good football player, really good player. He has been, as you noted, sort of uh, he's been held back by poor quarterback play throughout his career. This is not his last chance for a big contract, because if he takes a one year deal somewhere, he would be able to cash in next offseason. But I think it could be his last chance for like a big multi-year deal, right? If he signs a four year deal, he was what? 2014 draft. He played four years in Jacksonville and four years in Chicago. He's been eight years in the league already. Like this is a guy who's been around. So I think it'll be compelling. I think beauty is a bit in the eye of the beholder for Allen Robinson. Like when you see him, you don't see the guy who's got the elite speed. He's not Devante Adams with his route running, but what he is, is consistently makes catches in competitive situations. Really good in the red zone. He's big. He up until, you know, durability is going to be one of the things that's brought about because he's had a couple of things recently, but you know, the ACL tear, which I don't hold against him. That's, that's the kind of thing that's fluky. Um, but I think he's, you know, tough enough player, great dude. Like, I think all those things, like you're going to get the best out of Allen Robinson, whoever signs him. So if I had to guess the number, like, I think the question is whether he can push something like 18, $19 million per year. Right. If the you know, I believe the top of the wide receiver market is still twenty two million dollars. I, I believe that people who use uh, DeAndre Hopkins, twenty seven and a half million dollar per year. I think I think it's I don't know how deep into the weeds we want to get. But it's I think a big it's a, bit ar- it's a like big a, argument in the Asian world. It's it's um, sure. A big topic. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. Uh, for those that are not as familiar, when DeAndre Hopkins got traded from Houston to Arizona, he had three years and $39 million left on his deal. That's $13 million per year. He, representing himself, tacked on two more years at 50 or 55 million total. So you do the math there, that gets you to 94. So the Cardinals would say, hey, we're paying him less than $19 million per year. Hopkins would say, I signed an extension at $27.5 million per year. We can quibble over it forever. But um, I think $18 or $19 million per year for Allen Robinson would be interesting, especially when we're hearing guys who are clearly lesser and less accomplished pushing $13, $14, 15000000 million per season at wide receiver. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely a market that I'm very intrigued by just because of how much of a failure last year's class was in terms of the money that went out plus this year's wide receiver draft class, which is stacked as we all just saw in Indy. All right. We started this off over here by talking about how this isn't a top heavy for agent class, but you yeah. know, there are guys in the middle who are some of your under the radar free agents who maybe the average fan does not know about, but you believe could end up getting a good payday here in the coming days. Right. That's a good question. Um, all right. So here's like, you know, to talk about wide receivers, like, $15 million per year. So you look back at last year's, like we're looking for who's the next Kendrick Bourne, right? Because he was talking, exactly. no one was talking about him last year. And he, I think you can make the case. He was, you know, in terms of value, he was one of the more valuable wide receiver free agent pickups last year. I think Russell Gage is a solid player. Came on for the Falcons late in the season. Um, he's play, you know, played a lot. They were you know, obviously without Calvin Ridley for much of last year. And then Julio Jones in that lineup. Solid player coming off uh, or coming into the prime of his career. He'd be an example of a guy that I'd say to myself, like, all right, I, I can get something there uh, for for Russell Gage. Like, and I don't know the number is going to be, but if, if, it's, if it's six million a year, I think that's good value. Uh, Cedric Wilson, by that same token, for the Cowboys, which sounds like they're interested in bringing him back, but I think he's a really good player. Like, I think part of the reason why he's not talked about more is because he was what fourth or fifth on his own team, but that just. Yeah. The Cowboys having an embarrassment of riches at wide receiver. Those are two guys that come to mind. A tight end. I think Tyler Conklin's a good player. Athletic, does some stuff in the middle of the field. Long lever guy, like like I said, good athlete. Like I think he can be a useful player. And I think you're going to see the Gronks and the Zach Gertzes and those, uh, you know, that are maybe at the top of the market for tight ends this offseason in terms of where they sign for. Like, give me some Tyler Conklin. I think he's a good, good player. I think there are there's almost always going to be values amongst the offensive and defensive linemen because um, frankly, because we don't really talk about them that much. Right. Like fair. not, not too many people are like super familiar with like James Daniels from the bears. Right. Who might end up being the highest paid guard this off season. I, I mean, uh, in terms of free agents, right. He's, right. but he's n- never misses time, not like a dominant player, but he plays every snap and there's something to be said for reliability. Right. Um, so he's not a value play per se, but he's an interesting name that I've got my eyes on this off season. Um, trying to think of other guys that come to mind for values, any position in particular that you're, you're kind of coveting or sort of just all over the board. Yeah, it's kind of all over the board. I mean, I, again, the offensive line is definitely a good category to go in. I mean, again, I don't think there'll be yeah. like value guys, but like a Bradley Bozeman could be somebody who just gets a nice payday sure. there in free agency. Emmanuel Ogba on the defensive line is another one. I think there are a bunch yeah, of guys I think he'll get paid pretty good money. Yeah. 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 He, he's definitely found the home in Miami. Let's put it that way. I used to write a piece. I don't know why I didn't do it this year. It was, and we do it like in the middle of the season. It was like five guys are going to make more money than you realize. And it was sort of getting ahead of it. Right now, a lot of us are talking about the same people, right? Like the Christian Kirks of, of the world, who I think everybody believes is in for a nice payday, right? But like we used to do this back in like October, or November. And it was always interesting because there was like a little bit less influence. I feel like right now there's a lot of influence because a lot of people are talking. You've got teams telling what they're hearing and agents telling what they're hearing. Um, and I think that right, you know, like back in the season, it's sort of just like yeah, just looking ahead a little bit more. I should have done that this year because I would have had a better list for you. Yep. I mean, I actually just put the, I, I didn't do it in season, but I just put one out here this past week of something similar to that. Guys who get paid more than you would expect um, up on PFF.com. So um, people want to check go. it okay. out. It's all there. All right. Couple that life really prohibits you from uh, it's harder to pay attention to everything in, the, in dead light. That's that's one of the realities yes. I will say. Yes, I know. Uh, I, I have a bunch of brothers up above me who have kids, and um, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Um, a couple more before I wrap this up. I want to ask you sure. about one team in particular here, and that's the Giants. You kind of mentioned the Galladay contract, but 
a new regime coming in, Joe Shane, Brian Dayball, they have two top 10 picks, but that roster feels like it's just in no man's land. So many yep. big contracts, obviously the offensive line isn't great. The quarterback situation is still not, you know, officially, is he the guy or not? How do you think they should approach this offseason? Is it continue going forward? Let's take a step back over here. How do you see them doing here this offseason with a new regime coming in? Yeah, I think that Joe Shane should do what he saw his colleague in Buffalo, Brandon Bean, do. We were talking about it earlier with the Bears, and I think there's a similar path there. The difference in Chicago is that, like, you know who you have to build your franchise around going forward. It's Justin Fields. We're in, in New York. We just don't know. Um I think the decision on Daniel Jones' fifth-year option will be one of the most interesting of the offseason. They, they have a lot of time on that one, but it'll be really fascinating and I think enlightening in some ways, um, especially if they pick it up. Uh, so if I were, if I were the, the, the Giants, though, like everybody's up for grabs. We've already seen them cut guys like Kai Rudolph and Devontae Booker. We've seen them restructure contracts of Blake Martinez – and Sterling Shepard. And part of that is just to like get them underneath the cap. Like they've got a lot of big numbers there, but you got to make some decisions as well. And other guys, right? Like I'm not saying you should be trying to field trade calls for Leonard Williams, but you got to figure out if you're going to move some money around on Leonard Williams, is that because you view him as a part of your future beyond the next two years under contract for, or what? Same thing with James, James Bradbury, who's in the final year of his deal has a $2 million salary guarantee kick in, I think on the first or second day of the league year. Yeah. Um, he's a really good player, but if you're the Giants and you think you might be sort of retooling or rebuilding, would you be better off trying to get some value for a guy who a year from now could easily bolt in free agency at 15 or 16 or $18 million per year? So I would be following a similar script as we discussed earlier in Chicago. And you, you got to get a really, really good sense on Daniel Jones early this season. Like, you need to know for sure. And no one asked me, but if I were the Giants, it's a difficult decision and a difficult conversation to have. But I would decline the fifth-year option on Daniel Jones and say to him, I got to tell you something good, Daniel. If you play really well, we've got two options. We're franchise tagging you or you're walking into free agency and you'll make so much more per year then you will on that fifth year option. But if you're the Giants and you don't want to be where the Browns are and where the Panthers are right now, Mark Dominic, who used to work with me at ESPN, used to always say, I'm happy to be a year too late rather than a year too early to pay for a quarterback. And if Daniel Jones plays so well next season that I have to pay him $38 million per year because he's the real deal, fine. So be it. I've got a quarterback. But if he's no good and – we are stuck with a $20 million cap hit and a $20 million value next year. That's dicey. Yeah. I mean, I think we just saw it this past year with Carolina where they trade for Donald, pick up the option, and now it's kind of biting them. Again, if he plays well, you could decline and just use the tag, which will be a little bit more, but it's better than, again, like you said, what Mark Dominic said, um, it's better to be, um, you know, not, not, not do what um, those teams have done clearly. All right. Last one here. Quarterback okay. who kind of retired, but I don't know if he's retired. Yeah. Tom Brady retired in early February, I think it was. We're now in March. He's yeah. clearly not closing the door. Peter King on this podcast last week said, if I'm a betting man, I would bet he's coming back. What side are you on? Is Tom Brady retired and just playing with us? Or is Tom Brady possibly coming back for his age 45 season? I'm going to go on the side of he's retired um, because I don't know specifically what he's going to do. Um, a couple of things I can say is it's clear, like the, it, like he's gone. He's still one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, right? Second in passing yard or sorry, passing yard leader in passing touchdown. Game. Like it's not about ability anymore uh, for Tom. I don't know specifically. So like, I just, I just don't know. So I'm going to go with what, like I'm going to go with inertia, right? Like he's currently retired. So he'll stay retired. Um, I think this is much more salary cap driven and Brad would be able to answer this. And I have, I should look into this closer myself, but Ali Marpet recently retired from the Buccaneers. His paperwork was filed. Like he has been placed on the reserve yes. retired list. Tom Brady has not been, I don't know if that means nothing, if it means something or if it's simply a cap thing and they just need him to wait until after June 1st or what the circumstances are. Um, as of right now, I'll say he's not playing. 
but I just don't know. I think that this week will be very instructive. If the Bucks do nothing and we're staring at the Bucks and Kyle Trask slash Blaine Gabbard as their quarterback, my radar will go back up because that roster, especially if they like keep some other key guys, right? They keep Gronk or Leonard Fournette or Ryan Jensen, whoever it is. If they keep those guys, like that might tell you something. Yeah, I mean, again, it sounds like he's going to be a topic throughout this offseason. Again, I have no idea if he's doing it just for fun or if he's actually serious about it. The Bucks do have his rights. Jason Light at the Combine said he's leaving the light on on a potential return. You never know what could happen. Bruce Aarons was joking about what would be a, a possible trade for him. But again, like you mentioned, they have a bunch of key guys set to hit the free agent market. And that all starts this week with free agency. Field, I want to thank you for coming on. Best of luck this offseason. And um, hopefully we can do this again later on. Thanks for having me on, Ari. And for anybody who doesn't listen to this right away, listen to like a little bit after the fact. And like 50% of our conversation is outdated because guys have signed or been traded. My apologies, but I appreciate you guys turning it on all the same. It's going to be a frenzy. Let's put it that way. Can't wait.